Mercy Me is coming to Pittsburgh. The Together Again Tour with Mercy Me, Crowder, and special guest Andrew Ripp. Thursday, October 5th. Bring your family and friends to the PPG Pain Serena in Pittsburgh for Mercy Me, Crowder, and Andrew Ripp live in concert. Three multiple award-winning artists on one stage for one night. Let your spirit soar, your heart sing, and your faith ignite. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. Get your tickets now at mercyme.org. It's exciting that the business boutique was made for you. I know that I can make a difference in people's lives, and I want to do that. Hearing a lot of what other people are going through is really healing in a sense and motivating as well. I have the world in my hand, and I can do whatever I want. Learning from some of the top leaders who can make these dreams a reality is just so exciting. It ignited a passion in me to know she can do that, we can do that too. I'm so blessed to have heard the podcast that led me to this moment. Everyone, and welcome to the Business Boutique Podcast. I'm Christy Wright, and today we're talking about how to find your business idea. Now, this is the first episode of 2017, and today we're focusing on all the dreamers out there who want to start a business, but they don't know where to start. Now, I know this can be a daunting task, but today we're going to make it a lot less scary. There's no better time to start your business than right now at the beginning of a new year. Now, later on in the show, I'll be interviewing blogger, author, and speaker Jess Connolly about how she turned her hobby into a thriving small business. I'll also be answering your questions about your dreams, ideas, and how to start your own side business. But first, let's dive into how to find your business idea. If you've been around the business boutique for any amount of time, you probably know that we have three groups of women that we work with. There are the dreamers. You want to do something, but you're not sure what. We also work with the starters. You have a business, but you're right in the process of getting it off the ground. And we also work with builders. You have been running a successful business for more than a year, and you're ready to grow it to the next level. Now, one of the number one questions that I get from the dreamers, for those of you out there that you want to do something, but you're not sure what, is how to find your business idea. And what's interesting is as I work with dreamers, I've found that dreamers fall into one of two categories. Usually, they have one of two problems. There are some dreamers that really struggle with figuring out what their idea should be. This is you if you want to do something, but you don't have any clue where to start. Maybe you struggle with knowing which hobby to turn into a business. Maybe this is you if, unfortunately, you feel like you don't have any strengths to offer. Let me stop right there and tell you, you definitely do. We just need to identify what those strengths are. Or maybe you're a dreamer and you've always had the desire to earn extra money, but you're not sure what you could do that would actually create that income. So there are some dreamers out there that really want to do something, but they don't even know where to start. Maybe that's you. Now, there's a second category of dreamers, and they have a totally different problem. And I'll tell you, this is the category that I fall into. Some of our dreamers have too many ideas. This is you if you're a creative and you have a ton of hobbies and you have a ton of strengths and you have a ton of ideas. You might be like me and you have a new business idea every single day. This is fun and exciting, but you and I both know you can't be successful at five or 10 or 15 ideas. To be honest, you can't even be successful at two or three ideas. You need one idea. You need to narrow down all of your many possibilities into one thing that's going to be the most successful for you as a business. You're going to have the most success when you focus on one thing. So today, I'm talking to all the dreamers out there, those of you that want to do something but you're not sure what, and we're going to talk about how to find your best business idea, whether you don't know what you want to do or you have too many ideas, we're going to help you get on the path to finding your best business idea so that you can turn that into income for your family. There are five things that I want you to ask yourself to help you narrow this down and come up with your best idea. Let's go through these five questions. The first question that I want you to ask yourself is what are your strengths? What comes effortless to you? What have you naturally always excelled at? What skills or education or experience do you have that you might be able to turn into a profitable business? Now, this is the best starting point to look at because this is where you can be the most successful. If you stay in your strengths, your business is going to have a much better chance in the marketplace because you're doing what you're good at. As a bonus, it's also going to save you a ton of money because you already have the talents you need to build the business. 
and you're going to enjoy it the most because people tend to have more fun when they're doing what they're good at. I don't know about you, but I don't like focusing on spreadsheets and I don't like singing because those are two things that I am not good at. But speaking or coming up with creative ideas are two things I'm really good at, which is why I like to do those things. I'll tell you a few years ago, I had the idea to become a certified and credentialed life coach. And when you become a life coach, you have to have a focus. And I decided to focus on business. And what's interesting is when I had this idea to become a certified life coach, one of the things I realized was that I had actually been coaching for a long time. It wasn't something that I was going to start when I got my credential or my certification. It was something I had been doing for years because I just was naturally good at it. I helped friends get out of debt with the principles that I learned by working for Dave Ramsey. I helped friends run marathons or complete their first 5K because I've always been a natural runner and enjoyed running. I've helped other friends meet different types of goals. I love seeing people get to where they want to be. I love helping them think of creative ways to get past hurdles. So coaching wasn't something I was going to start once I got my credential or my certification. Coaching was something I'd always been doing because it's who I am. It's something I'm naturally good at and gifted at. It's something I was created to do. So what is that for you? What is something that people always comment on? Man, you're so good at that. Wow, that comes really naturally to you. What are some of those things that fall in your strengths? When you start to look at your strengths, it may give you your very best business idea. And there are several ways to look at your strengths. You can take a personality assessment, of course, like the Myers-Briggs or the DISC assessment. Those are great ways to look at what you can be the most successful in. And I have some exciting news for you. If you want to take a DISC assessment and learn more about your personality and your strengths, I have an offer later in the show where you can actually take that test for free, a special offer just for you, the podcast listeners. So stay tuned for that. You can also just ask people what they notice about you hey, what am I really good at? What do you see standing out in my skills or strengths? People might actually give you some advice on things you hadn't thought of otherwise. You know, another example is one of my very good friends, Jenny, has worked in public relations. And what's interesting is Jenny is incredible with people. When she walks into a room, she can win the crowd over within seconds. And when I commented to her one time on how good she is with people, I said, Jenny, you can win people over in an instant. And what's funny is she kind of laughed and said, well, I don't feel like I'm doing anything that exceptional. I feel like I'm just being me. And that's what working in your strengths looks like. It's just you being you. It's you doing those things you were created to do. They're your gifts. They're your natural abilities. It's those things that come effortlessly to you. So the first question to ask yourself when thinking about what business you should start is what are your strengths? You can take a personality assessment. You can look at your past and your history of things you've always been naturally good at or excelled at, or you can ask family and friends what they notice about you. But finding your strengths is going to be a great starting point for finding your best business idea. Not only will the business be the most successful, but you're going to have the most fun. And as a bonus, you'll save yourself a ton of startup costs and money because you already have the talents you need to build the business from. So that's your first question. What are your strengths? Now let's look at the second question. The second question that I want you to ask yourself when thinking about your next business idea is what do you enjoy? What hobby or interest have you always had that you do just for fun? You don't do it for the money. You do it because you love it. So instead of trying to dream up all of the infinite possibilities of businesses that you could start, just remember what you've always loved to do. Maybe even thinking back as far as when you were a child. What things did you love when you were a child? For example, growing up, I had always loved horses. Whether I was visiting my dad's house or my aunt who lived on a farm as well, or if I spent the summer at camp where I got to ride horses, I've always loved horses. So fast forward 20 years, and I started my first side business boarding horses to help me pay rent on a farm. That wasn't a coincidence that my first business idea came from something I had always loved to do. And you guys know I did years of research before I ever launched the business boutique. And I'll tell you, I saw the same thing in every single woman that I interviewed. When I asked women how they got the idea to start that particular business, every single one of them said something to the effect of, I had always loved. I had always loved organizing. I had always loved design. I had always loved sewing. I had always loved details and planning events. You know, I'd always loved numbers. I knew I was going to do something with numbers, and now I'm an accountant. It's interesting because many of the best business ideas can be traced back to something you had always loved to do. 
And when you start to think about what you enjoy, it may give you your next best business idea. Because let's be honest, we don't want to go through the hard work of building a business and all of the challenges that it brings if it's not worth it, if it's not for something we genuinely love to do. Because we know business can be hard, but whenever you're doing something you love, it's absolutely worth it. So the second question to ask yourself in dreaming up your next business idea is what do you enjoy? What have you always loved? The answer to that question may give you the next step in figuring out your business. The third question I want you to ask yourself is where is the money? Think Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Y'all, the point of business is to make money. Remember, we're not running hobbies here. I'm not helping people with their hobbies. I'm helping you with your business. And you've heard me say this before if you've been listening, but I'll say it again. There is the difference between a hobby and a business. A hobby costs you money. A business makes you money. Now, of course, I know that we want to help people, but the way that we're able to help people is from the profits that we create in our business. Your business idea has to have some type of financial return and profit earning potential for it to work. And unfortunately, as I've learned in my own experience and in coaching others, every business idea is not a profitable business idea. So you've got to narrow down your ideas to those that can actually earn you money. So think about it this way. What problems can you solve for people? What needs can you fill for people? What is something unique that you can offer from your strengths or from those things that you enjoy like we talked about? Because your ideas and answers to those questions might help point you in the direction of where the money is. Because those are types of things that people are willing to pay for. Okay, so let's back up. We've talked about what are your strengths, and we've talked about what are things that you enjoy. So let's look at my horse boarding example. I had always loved horses. I decided to move to a farm and start a side business boarding horses. But how I got that idea, that profitable business idea, was actually something unique about the farm that I lived on. As you can probably expect, most farms are out in the country. It's not in suburban areas. It's not in neighborhoods. But you have to drive quite a ways to be able to find land where you could have horses and be able to care for animals in that way. But here's something interesting. The farm that I moved to was right smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood in Bellevue. It's a community in Nashville that's not that far from the city. It's a great neighborhood where there's tons of families, there's YMCAs and grocery stores and schools. It's right in the middle of tons of activity and families. What's interesting about this farm is it was right at the end of a dead-end road where there were tons of houses, but this particular piece of land was a floodplain. So commercial developers couldn't turn that land into homes, and they couldn't continue the neighborhood that far. So I was able to live on 40 acres of land with a barn on a farm right in the middle of a neighborhood. I mean, y'all, a Publix was literally two miles from me. That's unheard of. So I saw that as a unique opportunity because maybe, just maybe, there were families in that community that had a horse or wanted to have a horse and they didn't want to drive 45 minutes to a farm where they boarded it. Maybe they would love to drive five minutes or 10 minutes to be able to see their horse and ride their horse on a Saturday afternoon. So I came up with my business idea because of something unique about the farm that I lived on. Not only was I going to start a boarding business, but I was able to market that as a horse boarding business in town. So you're starting to see the theme here. I had always been good with horses and had experience with horses as a strength. I had always loved horses. And now where's the money? Well, there's an opportunity for me to board horses at this particular farm because of something unique that I offered. I had a piece of land in the middle of a neighborhood that would be able to serve families much closer than other farms further out in the country. Now, you guys know I'm all about pursuing your passion, but if your business can't make you money, then it's not a real business. It's a hobby. So as you're asking yourself these questions to find your best business idea, you definitely want to ask yourself, where is the money? How can you turn your strengths or your passions, something that you enjoy, into a profitable business idea? Okay, so let's stay on the money theme for a minute, and I want you to ask yourself the fourth question. What do you already have to work with? And what I mean by that is, what resources or supplies or space do you already have to work with that could be a business? And the reason this applies to the money that you're going to make is because your business has the best chance to make that money and be successful if you keep your costs down. 
And a great way to keep costs down and starting a business is to start with what you have. You don't have to have even half of the things that you think you do. Most people think, oh, I can't start a business because I don't have the money, or I don't have the equipment, or I don't have the perfect computer or the perfect website. You don't need the majority of the things that you think you do. Instead, look around you. Get creative. Start with what you have. When you start with what you have, you may not only save yourself a ton of money, but it may give you your best business idea. For example, when I moved to that 40-acre farm in Bellevue, it already had an 11-stall barn on the property. That was a barn that I had to work with without having to do anything. Now, you combine the fact that I had that barn to work with, with my childhood love of horses and my strength in working with horses, and the profitable business opportunity of the location of the farm in the neighborhood, y'all, that gave me this great profitable business idea to start my horse boarding business. Now, in moving to a farm, I could have come up with plenty of other ideas that don't fall in my strengths, that I haven't always loved to do, that wouldn't make me money necessarily, or that I didn't have something to start with. For example, what if I decided to do farming, like legit farming where you raise crops? First of all, I don't even know how to talk about that because I don't know the first thing about crops or raising vegetables. I kill every house plant that I have. So this would not be in my strengths, for example. But I also didn't have the soil ready. I didn't have the space. I would have had to, I don't know, till the soil. Is that what you do? You till it? I don't know. Plant seeds? I wouldn't have anything to start with. I wasn't ready. What I did have to work with was a barn. It was rickety and falling down, but you know what? The thing worked, and that's what I had to start with. It saved me so much cost and so much headache because I was able to start with something I already had. That is how my horse sporting business was able to be successful. Do you have a swimming pool? Maybe you can teach swim lessons. Do you have a sewing machine? Maybe you can sell handmade bags. Sometimes just looking around your house can give you ideas of what type of business you can start. And then there's the last question that I want you to ask yourself in trying to come up with your best business idea. And this question, I think, can be one of the most important. I want you to ask yourself, what are you passionate about? I actually saved this question for last because while most passions may come from within you, I honestly believe that you can find passion in almost anything you do if you choose to. So let's say, for example, that you have an idea for a business. It's in your strengths. You enjoy it. It can make you money, and you already have what you need to get started. Let's say, for example, that business is building custom furniture. Now, maybe you aren't particularly passionate about a table, but if you dig deeper, you might find something that you are passionate about. People. See, here's the thing. On the other side of every business transaction is a person, a person that you're helping, a person that you're serving, a person that you're loving. And when you focus on that person on the other side of your business that you're taking care of, it's no longer just a table. It's the place where a family gathers. It's the place where meals are shared and memories are made and lives are built. See, when you look at your business through the lens of the impact you're making, your passion becomes ignited by the people you're serving. It's not the product you're selling, but the difference that you're making that becomes what you're passionate about. Okay, so let's recap the five questions I want you to ask yourself when coming up with your next business idea. The first question is, what are your strengths? What are you naturally good at? The second question is, what do you enjoy? What do you do just because it's fun? The third question is, where is the money? Where is the opportunity for this business to make you money for your family? The fourth question is, what do you already have to work with? Maybe it's space or supplies or equipment. And the fifth question is, what are you passionate about? It might be a product or service, or it might just be the people you get to help through this business. Now, while you don't have to have a business idea that meets every one of these five criteria, the more that you can align them with your dream, the more successful that you will be. Now, I hope that these five questions get you on the path to figuring out your best business idea, but I don't want to stop there. I'll tell you guys, I love coaching women in their business, and I'm really excited because we are launching something brand new this spring, my very next digital mentoring course where I'm going to coach you every single week for nine weeks. We did this last fall, and it was a huge success. I love working with women one-on-one and helping them with their business. But instead of this course being for everyone, we are focusing on the dreamers. This next digital mentoring course is just for those of you that need to find your idea. 
I'm going to walk with you for nine weeks every single week to not only narrow down and find your best business idea, but help you take those initial steps to get it off the ground. Digital Mentoring is a nine-week course of live video sessions with me. I'm going to answer your questions, and we're going to work through your ideas in real time. You're going to get a personalized business plan, weekly homework, real conversation with a tight-knit group of women in the same stage that you are, and direct access to me so we can talk one-on-one about what you need in your specific situation. And by the end of nine weeks, your business will be up and running. Now, I realize that's a big promise, but I am up for the challenge and I believe that we can do it. That's right. At the end of nine weeks, you will have launched your business. And right now, I have an even better offer for you, my podcast listeners. Now, if you sign up for this digital mentoring course, you'll receive the DISC assessment test for free. Your DISC profile is going to tell you about your strengths and your weaknesses and your unique personality. It's just like we talked about earlier, because that can really help you find your best business. And as a bonus, knowing your personality style will also help you sell to personality styles that are different than yours. The DISC assessment is usually $29.95, but it's yours totally for free when you sign up for the digital mentoring course using the code BBWRITE. That's B-B-W-R-I-G-H-T. The link is in this week's show notes, or you can head over to businessboutique.com slash store. Don't miss this opportunity to turn your dream into reality. Now, I know one of your favorite parts of this podcast is hearing other inspirational stories of other women that are winning in business. And I'm so excited because I have someone here today with me that has done just that. My friend Jess Connolly is USA Today bestselling author and founder of the Naptime Diaries print shop. And she has turned her hobby into a successful small business. So I'm excited for you to hear her story of how she did it. Jess, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Christy. So good to be here and see your face at the same time. Yes. So I would love it if you would just give us a little bit of a backstory of how you got started in your blogging, but also your business, how this whole idea kind of came to life. Absolutely. They're very connected. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I was a mommy blogger. Mm -hmm. I actually started a blog before I had children and I wrote about hair. I've gone back to my very first post and it was a post about how much I love Jessica Simpson's hair. (laughs) And this was in the dinosaur ages of blogging. No one was blogging. Definitely nobody was really thinking about making money doing it. But my pastor's wife had a blog. And so I'd always seen blogging as really self-indulgent and like, oh, if you take yourself too seriously, you write a blog. But my pastor's wife had a blog. And so I was like, well, if my pastor's wife does it, then it must be holy. Mm-hmm. I can do sure, that. Absolutely. I'm allowed. So I decided to start a blog. My first post was about Jessica Simpson's hair, <laughs> shoes. I started to write about my pregnancy, subsequent children, and really just had a very traditional mommy blog. I would occasionally write deep things about my heart or what the Lord was doing in my life, but it was mostly like, we went to the zoo, Mm -hmm. or here's my favorite chili recipe. And it was just fun. I loved doing it. It was life-giving to me. I never thought anything about what I was doing, just did it. I had no plan, no strategy. And essentially what happened in our life is how we find a lot of bloggers becoming well-known is that our family went through a lot of tragedy. We went through a lot of hard times. We were in ministry in the midst of the recession, and so we literally were at poverty level, um, like on paper. I don't say that figuratively. My husband couldn't find a job. Things were really stressful in our family. We had a lot of health issues. We had, we lost a baby. And as I continued to write about those things and process them on my blog— Without much thought put into it, people kept watching and kept following. And so I would say, you know, I was not in the place of thinking about how to grow my following at all. And it just happened really organically because I was being honest about what we were going through and how I felt about it. And that's also how our business emerged. I was in a season of really needing a lot of encouragement and needing a lot of truth spoken over our lives. And I was writing scripture on everything I could get my hands on post-it notes, paper, and posting it all over my house. And my husband said, this is getting excessive. There's um, (laughs) post-it notes everywhere, and they're falling. (laughs) We love God's Word. I'm so proud of you that you want to read the Bible, but what else could we do so that you aren't putting these post-it notes everywhere? (laughs) And I had the idea to make a pretty graphic. I wasn't a graphic designer. I didn't really know what I was doing. Basically went into like Microsoft Word and put some words in places and made a pretty graphic and printed it out and hung it in a frame and a friend said, you should sell those. And I did. 
and that's how our business began, essentially. And yeah. so from there, I feel like the Lord kind of started to pull some other things out about writing and speaking and other business ideas, but it never started with business as the goal, for sure. sure. So at what point did you realize that you wanted it to be more? It started out as these cute graphics that you were framing. At what point did you realize that you wanted it to be a legitimate business and kind of take it to the next level? For us, it was need. I mean, it was financial need. I remember the day before I wrote a blog post saying, like, look, I have this Etsy shop. And I remember looking at my husband and saying, what if this could, like, help us pay bills? Wouldn't that be great? Like, what if we could maybe one day afford to go on, like, a real date night? Wouldn't that be nice because we're in this hard season? And as we saw, it really began to meet our financial need. I think what then started in us is giving back and thinking about the families who are like us, who are struggling, who could use a hand up. We had a lot of friends who were fundraising for adoptions at the time, and then we thought, like, oh, for the first time, we could potentially give to these families who are fundraising for adoption. And so we have always been very financial financially driven once we decided to really put our hands to this. But it's been a little bit different financially driven. You know, we've gotten to take care of our finances and now give away. And so that's been a huge part of what keeps us going. But I think also hearing stories of other women who really needed scripture on their homes and really needed to hear God's word and really needed to hear encouragement, I think keeping them at the forefront of our minds is now a huge part of why we keep going. I love that it started with sticky notes. I used to lead a team at a local nonprofit here in Nashville, and they would all make fun of me because my office was just always covered in sticky notes. Mine were to-do lists, but it was just like I just operated out of sticky notes. Yes. And that has turned into what is now your business. So for our listeners that aren't familiar with what you're doing, tell us a little bit about your business as it is today and kind of what it's evolved into. Absolutely. It's gone through a lot of changes. The business is now called Amen Paper Company, and we sell scripture prints, canvases, devotionals, lots of different tools to help you paint scripture creatively on the walls of your heart and your home. So we really just like to meet busy women where they're at and give them pretty things to look at that also point them to God. I love that. And I love how you just said it so succinctly. Like it's, well, it's such a great example. Well, I've been at the business example. boutique, so <laughs> you said I'm working so on well. my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> you said it so perfectly. I love it. Well, tell us a little bit about, I know you started out blogging about Jessica Simpson's hair, which is yep. just super deep. Absolutely. Um, Number one. <laughs> super important. Tell us a little bit about how your content has changed over time. I know so many of our uh, listeners, they may have a blog, and if they don't, they still have to create content. <laughs> as we know, content's such a driver for business. Uh, for you, how has your content changed and become more focused, and what does that look like? I think the biggest thing that has changed is that I've stopped writing about what I want to write about, and I have started writing about what I really believe other women need to hear. And I know that A lot of that is just truth and grace and story, but it helps me filter a lot because I am a person who has a lot of things to say. I walk (laughs) around with content. (laughs) Yes, I I have 18 blog posts in my head at all times, and so I have to filter and say, what if this do I just want to say, and what do they need to hear? If they only hear one thing today, you know, if we're walking around with these phones in our hands and there's this visual connection straight to our hearts, what's going to impact them and shift them and encourage them right there where they're at? I guess the next obvious question is, how do you know what that is for you, and it may be different for different people, but I can just imagine our listeners thinking, gosh, that sounds great, but how am I supposed to know what my listeners or what my viewers or readers need? Yeah. I think a great question is, what are people asking you over and over and over again? What are they asking you? I find that women ask me the same three or four questions over and over and over again. Yeah. And so I think of it like a disco ball, and I'm trying to turn that disco ball and continually answer it in different ways. So a I number one question. That. That's awesome. Yeah. A number one question I'm always getting is how do you spend time with God? So to be honest, my answer is really simple. Like I open my Bible, I read it, I pray. That's a really honest, simple answer. But how can I say that in 20 different ways? And how can I say it in a more compelling way? How can I say it in a grace-filled way today? How can I say it in a challenging way? How can I give somebody else's perspective on it? But that's the number one question. You know, the second question would be how do you do so much? Okay, let me answer that in a bunch of different ways. You know, let me answer in a way that frees you up. Let me answer in a way that calls you to a little bit more. But just continually turning that ball of that same question. And I would think, too— answering it in the way that you're doing it on that particular day, because tomorrow it may be totally different. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think even if you're like, well, I don't have customers or I don't have followers, like your friends ask you one question over and over again, even if it's like, how do you line your lips like that? You know, there's something behind that. So for blogging, I know you said that you started really in the early days of blogging before it was super popular and it happened organically, the growth Mm -hmm. did. How would you tell people that want to start a blog about anything to get that following? Because that's one of the number one questions I'm asked when it comes to blogging is how do I get 
views? How do I increase my following and my readership of my blog? Such a good question. And I think the key is community. I think you guys have built something beautiful with the business boutique and encouraging women to connect with one another in the business boutique community, encouraging them to talk. And I'll say, I almost feel tender for women who are coming up in this age of blogging because they immediately hear the word platform and they get freaked out or they think of that as something that they need to build. But I grew up in the age of blogging where nobody was really thinking about that. We were meeting our best friends online. We were just eager to talk. We were eager to hear about other people. And so I didn't think strategically really about making connections. I just made connections. I got on Twitter and used hashtags not to find other people and have them all follow me, but to really be able to engage. And so I'd say in the beginning, really genuine engagement with people helps. I mean, that's everything. And not approaching the world. I mean, I'm sure you encounter a lot of this, Christy, when people have like 20 followers and in their bio, it says like expert at social media. And you think like, well, (laughs) how do you define expert? (laughs) Yeah. And I think there's a lot of that. There's a little bit of this, like we have to say that we're an expert and we have to kind of step in as like platform, this, that strategy. But there's just such beauty in saying like, I want to connect with other women. That's really should be a lot of what drives us. You know, if we're writing a blog, we're putting out content is helping other people, benefiting other people, connecting with other people. And so I think doing that genuinely, I'm not saying spend eight hours on Twitter a day. I'm not saying, you know, follow 6,000 people on Instagram, but genuinely making connections is a huge part of it. I think that's so true. And you said something really interesting earlier where you said you have to filter yourself before Mm. you write a post. And it made me think of one of the things that I teach women, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, is I believe a lot of people, especially with boutique businesses, I think a lot of them have this idea that having a blog is kind of a rite of passage into business and that you have to have one. And one of the things I encourage them is to think about some questions before they start a blog because many of them, they think, I want to have a business, so I'm going to run out and start a blog. And they get graphics and images, and they choose a logo and a WordPress theme, and they sit down to write only to discover any one of these three things. One, they don't have anything to say. They don't like to write, and they're not good at writing. And so in that case, writing's probably not for them. And so one of the things that I've experienced experience is that you really have to put out excellent content. You need to be gifted at writing or at least learn how to be gifted at writing because if you write these long, rambling posts about only things you're interested in that your reader doesn't want to know, it's only going to hurt you, not help your business. So I think there's such wisdom in the fact that you, even at this stage, have to filter yourself of what you say. Absolutely. You are totally right. I hear so many women say, like, should I start a blog? Or I feel like I should start a blog. And you really do want to, like, kind of say, like, okay, shake your head and then say why. Because we're just so gifted now with so many different mediums. I just think there's even so many other ways that you can get your message out if you're a business owner, if you have something you want to do. And if medium to long form writing isn't your thing, Instagram is such a great tool. Facebook Live is such a great tool. Twitter is such a great tool. Periscope, all the things. It doesn't necessarily have to be a blog, but it can be a gift. You know, it is something that shares in a different way and people can interact with it in a different way. And so it can be such a gift if you're gifted at it, if it feels right for your context all of those things. So when you started out, like you said, it was just really a creative outlet for you and yeah. something you enjoyed. Today in your business, where does blogging fit in? Like in the structure of your business, how does it meet needs for your business, drive sales? What does that look like today? Absolutely. And it changes constantly. And I've been through lots of different phases. And I've gone through phases where months where I'm like, I can't even touch that thing. Mm-hmm. But I like the medium to long form blog post style too. I like something that's a little bit longer than Instagram. That is something for people to chew on and constantly come back to. So how I'm using my blog right now is any thought that is too long for Instagram and not a whole book, I will write about it. And I schedule my content out. So maybe I'm only doing one post a week. Maybe I'm doing two posts a week. And I like those posts to be really reflective of who I am and what you're going to find of me everywhere else on social media. So that if somebody comes to my website from any other different channel and they click on blog, they see like, oh, I get who she is. And so just to clarify for our listeners, when you say medium to long form, what are we talking in words for you? For me, oh gosh. Well, and yeah, different people would say different things for blog posts. I would say 700 to 1,000 words for me. Okay. I think that's a good rule of thumb because many people may feel like that there's a one-size-fits-all. And for any of our listeners that read Seth Godin, for example, his mm-hmm. blog posts are probably 100 words more right. often than not. Yeah. Mine fall in the five to 600 range. Yours would be 700 to mm-hmm. 1,000. So there's not really a rule of thumb, but I think it's good for you to define like what's your sweet spot that comes naturally to you. Yep. 
and kind of stay within that. And so that's kind of the front side of blogging in your business. But what about the behind the scenes? Like how does the blog serve your business in terms of from a revenue standpoint or from a marketing standpoint? Are you strategic in planting your products in the post and that type of thing? How do you make that work on the backside? Absolutely, yeah. I would say it serves two really big purposes for me. Number one is it's something to go viral. I try to write all of my posts with that intentionally. How could this go viral? Is it something that someone else would want to share that they'd feel encouraged to share? And it's something to go viral. And then I would say in almost every single post, I either have a call for my newsletter or a call to go buy my book. And those are my two big things that I'm working on growing right now. I'm not selling any other specific products. I love Instagram and I utilize Instagram a lot to put out thoughts almost every single day, like pretty deep thoughts. Because again, all the content is always forming. But those don't go viral as easily. And I like to interact with people in a really deep way on those. And that's not what my blog is for, for me. It's something that people feel great about sharing and then always pushing back to the two things that I'm trying to grow right now. Okay, Jess, I know I have a lot of women that I work with that do want to start a blog and they're gifted writers, but they've never done it before and they're not sure where to start. What are some of those first early steps that you would encourage someone that wants to start a blog? What do they need to do to get started? I would ask them, I would encourage them to write down two things first before they ever start to really know these two things before they ever buy a domain or anything like that. I would tell them to write down who do you want to talk to and what do you want to say to them. Just really two very honest things. People go years into blogging without ever answering that question. I think it's really important to just start with those two things. And then I would encourage them to not overthink it, (laughs) to not spend $300 building the most beautiful blog ever. Take it step by step, baby step. Don't stress out. Don't feel like you have to look at some crazy, very well-known blogger and copy what they've done. Just start using your words and do it creatively and engage with your community. I like it. So as we wrap up, I know a lot of the women may be at different stages of business, but they want to have something. They want to grow it to where it's providing an income. Mm -hmm. You talked about this in your own business of supplementing their finances or being the primary source of income. I would love it if you would just give them some words of encouragement from your journey in business of going from, you know, those times of struggling and just the kind of progress you've made over the last years in business. Give them some words of encouragement as we kind of wrap up that they can do this as well. Absolutely. I would encourage them first by saying they are 100% not the provider, even when they feel like the provider and even when the money needs to come in. And there were so many times I had to continually tell myself, God's the provider in this situation and not just the provider of the income and the finances, but God is the provider of the inspiration. When you breathe him in deep, when you take deep breaths of him and life and creativity and culture, then you get to exhale whatever it is that you do. So I would say keep a healthy inhale of life around you, whatever you do. And I would also say it's going to be great. I mean, it's really going to be great. If you decide it's going to be great, it's going to be great. Earth is fallen and it's hard and there's hard stuff all around us, but we get to decide so much of our outlook and our perspective. And at the end of the day, if we say really nothing is a huge problem and it's going to be great, it is going to be great. I love it. I can't think of a better way to wrap up. Jess, thanks so much for taking some time with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Isn't Jess awesome? Now, I hope that her insight and her story into starting her business inspires you like it has me. I love hearing examples of women winning. And now I want to introduce you to a new segment here on the show. Last year, I told you that beginning in 2017, I would start answering your questions on the podcast. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take questions that you send me from my email address, podcast at businessboutique.com, Twitter at Christy B. Wright, my Facebook page, and from the community at businessboutique.com. And that's where this episode's questions come from, the Business Boutique community. Now, our first question comes from Rebecca, and she asks, how do you narrow down your ideas to focus on one? Rebecca, I hear you. This is a struggle for me. Now, anyone that knows me knows that I have 500 ideas going through my head at any given moment. I am creative, which means sometimes I'm a little scattered. I'm resourceful, but that means I'm occasionally a little scrappy. And I'm spontaneous, which means I'm a little unpredictable. And the truth is that most creative, entrepreneurial type of people are like this. We have no shortage of ideas, ideas that we just know are brilliant, by the way, but we have a real shortage of follow through. Having new ideas is an awesome advantage in business. But when you act on all of your ideas, you dilute your efforts. You reduce your efficiency and ability to grow one business well while you confuse the heck out of your customers. And the truth is, I know that you probably have a lot of ideas because you're good at a lot of things. Your list of talents is probably very long. 
The list of options of what you could do with those talents is also very long. But just because you can do something does not mean that you should. Every opportunity is not the right opportunity for you. Now, I know that it's hard to resist doing everything. Trust me, I fight this urge daily. It's especially tough because our culture encourages us to wear busyness like this badge of honor. But if you chase everything, you end up doing a lot of things and none of them well. Your resources are going to be pulled in too many different directions. You'll end up scattered and unsuccessful. And on top of that, your family and friends will probably miss you because you're doing so many things. So instead, I want you to focus on one idea. Ask yourself the five questions we talked about earlier in this episode to find your best business idea. Most likely, of your many, many, many ideas, only a couple probably align with those five questions. And on top of that, your family and friends will probably miss you because you're so busy trying to do so many things. Now, I'm not saying you can only pursue one talent or one hobby in your life, but if you focus on one thing you're really good at and passionate about, you're setting yourself up to win. Now, think about it this way. Even the most successful companies know this. For example, Chick-fil-A doesn't sell hamburgers. Starbucks doesn't publish magazines, although they tried and failed in 1999. Last year, Victoria's Secret stopped selling everyday clothing in their catalogs, and next year they're exiting the swimwear business. Why? Because those products aren't their bread and butter. So instead of chasing every brilliant idea that pops in your head, I want you to figure out what you want to be known for and go be that. Focus on what your core business, your singular core business should be, and put your effort there. When you do this, You minimize the chance of becoming overwhelmed and you maximize the possibility of actually seeing your idea through. So Rebecca, I hear you. I know it's a struggle because I struggle with that as well, but I want you to pick one idea, your best idea, and try it. The great thing is when you're getting started, if it doesn't work out, you can always try something else as being your best business idea, but let's pick one and focus on that. Great question. Now, the second question we have comes from Jenny in Oklahoma, and Jenny's question is this. How do I figure out what I'm good at? Now, we talked about that a little bit earlier in the podcast episode when we talked about identifying your strengths. But there are a couple other things that you can ask yourself as well. One of the things you can think about is what education or experience do you have? Maybe you have a degree in something that can be incredibly valuable to someone else. You might take it for granted because it's something you went to college for or something unique that you know, but it might be something that can really help you in your business. You may also have some unique experiences in your life. You might have had some unique experiences in your personal story that could relate to your strengths in business. For example, as you probably know, I was raised by a woman entrepreneur and I was raised in the business. So I have a very unique perspective on business as being a child of a female entrepreneur and a single mom. That's part of my story and something I tie into Business Boutique that helps me do my business well. Jess Conley also gave you some examples of when she was blogging of how she related to her readers. Her personal story actually drew people to her. So when you think about what your strengths are, it's not as simple and cut and dry as just what your strengths are. It might be something simple like your education or something about your story and experiences that you've had that are unique to you. You also want to ask yourself, what gives you energy? Those things that you're naturally good at give you energy versus sucking you dry of energy. I'll give you an example. After our very first business boutique event in November of 2015, I'll give you an example. After our very first business boutique last November, I had been on stage for two days straight teaching. Now, this was after months and months of working tirelessly to create all of the content, all of the sessions, and all of the interviews that I would be doing on stage. So you would think Saturday night when I finally got home that I would want to get in my pajamas and crash into bed for as long as possible, but I didn't. You know what I did? I asked my husband if he would take me out on a date so that I could tell him everything about the weekend. We went to dinner in downtown Franklin, and I talked 100 miles an hour for a couple hours over dinner with my very patient husband as I recapped everything that happened. Because being on stage for two days speaking didn't exhaust me. It didn't suck me dry of energy. It actually gave me energy. Being in my strengths fires me up, and it will for you as well. So think about those things that afterwards— you're actually more energized than you were before you started. That may be a great clue into what your strengths are. That's a great question, Jenny. I think as you start to explore some of these different avenues, you'll find that you are probably good at a lot of things. So I hope this helps. Now, our next question comes from Kayla. And Kayla says, 
I love several different hobbies, but how do I know which one would be successful? Now, Kayla, this is a great question, and it definitely ties back to what we talked about earlier in question number three, which is where is the money? As you're trying to think of your idea, you want to know that this idea can be profitable. It can be a real business and no longer just a hobby. But in addition to figuring out how it's going to make you money, you also need to understand two other things to know if this hobby can be a successful business. The first thing you need to know is you need to know who your target market is. What person are you planning to serve with this business? Who is out there that needs what you have to offer? Once you identify that you have a target market and further than that, who they are, how do they think? How do they feel? What do they need from you? When you understand your target market, you then understand that there is a person, there is a group of people that your business exists to serve. If you're not existing to serve anyone, you can't stay in business. So understanding and identifying your target market is a very important step to knowing whether or not this hobby can be a successful business. And another important thing that you need to know to understand if your hobby can be a successful business is what problem do you solve? What need do you fill for your target market? Your business is going to exist to do something. So what are you doing? If you're a graphic designer, maybe you're creating awesome custom invitations for people. If you sew dresses, maybe you make awesome custom dresses for people for their little girls or for baby gifts. Your business exists to solve a problem for people. And so what is that problem that you're solving? What's interesting is as you identify not only what target market you serve, but what problem you solve for them, you've got the nuts and bolts of your marketing right there. Everything else will flow out of that. So it will not only help you knowing that your business can be successful, it's going to help you market that business as well. Kayla, I'll wrap up with one last piece of encouragement for you. The best way to know if your business can be successful is to do the thing. So get out there, dip your toe in the water and give it a try because you don't know if you never start. I hope this helps. All right, our next question comes from Danny, and Danny says, I need to be able to figure out what I'm good at. I feel that I'm not really good at much of anything, nothing that can be turned into a business. Danny, I hate to hear that, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that feel the same way that you do, but I just want you to hear me right now. I know we haven't met face-to-face, and I know that we may never meet face-to-face, but I know, Danny, that you are good at things. God created you on purpose with a purpose, and Danny, there are things that you are created uniquely to do, but you and other women of you out there that might be listening that feel the same way probably feel like that you're not good at anything for one reason only, and that is that you undervalue your strengths. It's not that you don't have strengths. You just don't know their strengths. Many people feel like that their strengths are just easy to everyone else. Maybe if you're good at accounting and numbers, you assume, well, everyone's good at accounting and numbers. Or maybe if you're a natural encourager and you're great at uplifting people and coaching people and helping people, you assume, well, everyone can do that, right? Or maybe if you're really good at coming up with creative ideas and you're great at marketing, you assume, well, everyone can do that, right? Or you're a talented painter, you assume, well, everyone can paint, right? We undervalue our strengths because we assume that what's easy for us is easy to everyone else, or what's obvious to us is obvious to everyone else. Danny, I'll tell you from experience, I have written thousands of blogs in my lifetime and articles for magazines and written talks for stage. And every time that I sit down to write something, I have the same thought. Why would you write this? Because everyone already knows this, Christy. They're going to read this and think, duh, what a waste of my time. But you know what I have to remember is that what's obvious to me is not obvious to everyone else. And the thing that's obvious to me, the thing that comes naturally to me might just be amazing to someone else. It might really help someone else. So Danny, I want to encourage you to look at your strengths, to ask yourself some of the questions that we've talked about in this podcast, and then to realize that those strengths have value. You have something unique to you that you have to offer that no one else has. And I want to encourage you to offer that because I promise you, there are people in this world out there waiting and they need you to. All right, our next question comes from Carol. And Carol says this, I want so badly to know the what. As I write this, I'm in tears, sitting at a job that I do not love because I have to be here. My why is to be able to have a flexible schedule to be able to take my girls to school and pick them up and make a decent living. I know I would be a good businesswoman. I just don't have any ideas or passions. 
and I'm jealous of those who have the ideas and follow their passions. Carol, I just want to encourage you and anyone that might be in your shoes as well. The reality is you do have things you're passionate about and you do have something to offer. Sometimes it's very easy in life to just get in a rut. We get so busy and so burnt out. We're rushed and running ragged. And sometimes life can just suck the life out of us. It's hard sometimes. And I know that to be true. I've experienced in my own life and I've coached tons of other women as well. I'll tell you the best piece of advice I can give you for someone in your shoes is I believe, Carol, that you just need someone to breathe life into you. I don't know if you have a friend in your life or a family member, someone in your church, or maybe someone in our business boutique community, but I want you to know there are people out there willing to help you, willing to brainstorm ideas with you, willing to ask you great questions that might provide some insight into something that you would love to do. Sometimes the best answers don't come from within ourselves; They come from an outside person, someone willing to intersect your life. And so you know what? You can do this. You would be great at this. What if you tried this? What if you tried this a different way? I can tell you in my own life, so much of what I've been able to do has come from the support and encouragement and advice and wisdom of other people. It's not because I have all the best ideas. I don't. A lot of what we do in the business boutique community comes from other amazing people that speak into it. So Carol, I know you may be struggling right now, but I just want to encourage you. You have something to offer. You have ideas. You have passions. They may just be buried within you, and it might be something that someone else might be the key to draw out. So I want to encourage you to reach out. You can reach out on our community or you can reach out to a family member or a friend. But this week, I want you to do something where you reach out for support or encouragement from someone else. Anyone winning in business or any area of their life for that matter knows that they didn't get there alone. They got there from the support and encouragement of other people. So I'm going to pray for you, Carol, that you are surrounded by an amazing group of women that can breathe life into you and to speak hope to you and give you just the idea or the passion that you're looking for. All right, guys, our final question comes from username M. Docina, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but she says, how do I figure out if my idea is a good one? A baby step system would be a great guideline to have. Now, here's the thing. We talked about this a little bit earlier when talking about the profitability opportunity of your business idea, identifying your target market, and figuring out which problem you're going to solve for them. If you do those three things, it's really going to help you get on the right path to understanding if your idea is a good one. But like I said, you don't know if you don't try it. So get out there and try it. But that's also the reason, guys, that I am launching the Digital Mentoring Program. This is the step-by-step plan to turn your dream and your idea into a real business. I want to help coach you one-on-one where I can speak into that and give you advice and encouragement on identifying if that idea is going to be a good idea. And not only that, how to take that idea, refine it, make it even better, and launch your business all in nine weeks. So I just want to remind you guys, we have a great deal for you where if you use the code BBWRITE when you sign up for the Digital Mentoring Program for Dreamers, you're going to receive the DISC Assessment Test for free. So it's a great opportunity if you're a dreamer to get your business idea and get your business launched all in the first couple months of the year. So don't miss out on the chance to turn your idea into a real business. All right. Now, if you have a question about something we've talked about here on the podcast or anything regarding your business, I'd love to hear from you. You can send me your questions via Twitter and Facebook by using the hashtag Ask Christy Wright. We've also set up a group in the Business Boutique community at businessboutique.com called hashtag Ask Christy Wright, where you send me your questions and interact with the rest of the women there. So send me your questions because I'd love to hear from you. Now, a few episodes ago, we gave away 10 copies of Dr. Meg Meeker's book, The 10 Habits of Happy Mothers. And I want to take a second to congratulate the winners. Our winners are Susie Starks from Florida, Ashley Williams in North Carolina, Amber Bacchus in Washington, Kathy Sorensen in Minnesota, Julie Austin in Wisconsin, Jill Winter in Illinois, Whitney Pettit in Texas, India Michael in Massachusetts, and Dolores Barkman in Canada. Congratulations, everyone. I hope you enjoy your book. All right, so let's talk about your homework for this week. It's going to be a little different depending on which stage of business you're in. Now, if you're listening right now and you are a dreamer, you want to do something, but you're not sure what, or maybe you have too many ideas and you're not sure how to narrow those down, I want you to walk through the five questions that we talked about and answer those questions. From there, I want you to come up with a list and brainstorm potential businesses that line up with your answers to those five questions. Now, if you're a starter or a builder, you may think that this doesn't apply to you, but I've got some homework for you too. 
Your homework this week is to share this podcast with a dreamer in your life. You may be a starter or a builder, and you may be further down the line, but we have the opportunity to help others along the way. So I want you to share this podcast episode with someone in your life that maybe has talked about having a little idea or having the desire to do what you're doing. How can you encourage them in their gifts and share this episode with them that might give them the jumpstart that they need to really do the thing? So that's your homework for this week. The Dreamers, I want you to answer your five questions and brainstorm a list of businesses. And if you're a starter or builder, I want you to share this podcast episode with the Dreamer in your life. Now, before we leave each other, I want to let you know that connecting with our Business Boutique podcast community is a great thing you can do. Y'all, there are so many women connecting and encouraging each other there. This week, I want you to go to businessboutique.com slash podcast. And in the comments to this episode, let me know the business ideas you came up with. Share them with me and with each other. I want to hear from you. I can't wait to see what ideas you share. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me as always. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. For more encouragement on how to make money doing what you love, visit businessboutique.com. Mercy Me is coming to Pittsburgh. The Together Again Tour with Mercy Me, Crowder, and special guest Andrew Ripp, Thursday, October 5th. Bring your family and friends to the PPG Pain Serena in Pittsburgh for Mercy Me, Crowder, and Andrew Ripp live in concert. Three multiple award-winning artists on one stage for one night. Let your spirit soar, your heart sing, and your faith ignite. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 5th. Get your tickets now at mercyme.org.